The shroud that was cast all over the people has been destroyed. Our separation from our God is gone forever, and death has been swallowed up forevermore. The Lord of hosts will wipe away every tear from our faces, and our disgrace is taken away. Our sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. We are forgiven, for the Lord has spoken, and Jesus has conquered the grave. It will be said on that day, this is our God. We have waited for him. He has saved us. This is our God. His steadfast love endures forever. He has saved us. This is our God. We have accepted his sacrifice and he has saved us. This is our God. We wait no more. He has made a way. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The kingdom of God is here. Let us be glad and rejoice. This is our God, and this is his salvation. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church. Jesus Christ is risen. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes. Amen. Amen. For us Christians, today is the most joyful day of the year because Jesus Christ, he conquered the grave and he gave us a victory of sins, sicknesses and diseases and pain, and he gave us eternal life. How about we all rise and greet each other and say to the person next to you and behind you, even a few pews after you, and just say, Happy Resurrection Day! Happy Let us pray together. 
Our dear Heavenly Father, we come together this morning to thank you for letting the sun, sun come up on this glorious Easter Sunday. We, we ask that you help us live in the joy and grace of Easter Sunday every day, to tell the good news about you to the entire world. We celebrate who you are, God, and what you've done for us. Through your forgiveness and love, you have made all this possible through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ. You are our, our rock, strong, bold, mighty, and unmovable. Dear God, we ask you to help us to be still in your presence and to focus on what Pastor Becky has received from you that will touch our hearts and help us in our daily walk with you. You are a rock, strong, bold, mighty, and unmovable. Dear God, we ask that you help us to be still in your presence and to focus on what Pastor Becky has received from you. We thank you, God, for our beautiful church. We thank you for our praise band that touches our hearts through song each week, and the tech support booth that quietly assists through the entire service. And dear God, we especially thank you for this blessed Holy Week that led us to the celebration of today, the day Jesus Christ rose from the dead. We pray all of this in the name, precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and happy Easter! Good morning, Easter. This opening song is just entitled Praise. Let's praise him. Can you stand and join us? Thank you, Lord.
on, sing his praises as we remember that he is to be crowned the King of Kings. Revelations 5, 13. And every created thing which is in heaven on earth and on the earth. Oh, 
finish off the service, okay? Anybody else coming? Here's a sign from our egg hunt. <laughs> it's still here. So I'm going to talk about an egg hunt. <laughs> so we had an egg hunt here last Sunday. So if you look around, there very well might be an egg hidden somewhere in this church because it was kind of really wet and cold and damp. So um, we had it here and up in the balcony in the social hall. So there is a chance, a small one, that maybe they didn't find all the eggs. But who here has done an Easter egg hunt? Anybody? Do you guys hunt like real eggs or plastic eggs? Plastic? Anybody hunt real eggs? Is that a dying thing? Oh, man, my kids hunted real eggs. We would dye them and then they would be hidden on Easter, and then they would have to find them, and you had to know how many you left out for the Easter Bunny, because if you didn't find them all, that could get stinky. So maybe that's why we don't do it anymore, right? <laughs> anyway, so, probably for time's sake, I'm just gonna have a few of you reach in here and grab an egg, shake it, and tell me what you think is in here. Do you wanna do one? Okay, before you open it. Oh, don't open that one yet. She got the golden egg in one, in one shot. What do you think's in there? Money? All right, let's see. Go ahead and open it. Next person can... Oh, money and a stamp. Do you want to do one? Okay, hold on. What do you think's in yours? Shake it. Maybe a coin? Okay, go ahead and open it. We'll finish upstairs because we won't get to everybody. What do you have in yours? It's a big one? You think it's candy? All right, let's see. Yay! All right, Emmy, you want to do one? I'll get to the rest of you guys upstairs, I promise. You think it's a piece of candy? All right, let's see. <laughs> What'd you get? Oh, wow, you got candy. Nice. What'd you get, Emmy? Candy? All right, one more, and then we'll get to Adriana. Can you guys open one? Oh, he's, he's going for two. All right, do you want to do one? There we go. Go ahead, shake it. What do you think's in there? Maybe a big candy, oh. You're right, some M&Ms. All right, so what do you think's in yours? A dollar? I don't know. Oh, no, hold it up so everybody can see it. What's in that egg? Nothing. Nothing. Would you be really disappointed if you were hunting eggs and you got an egg, especially the gold egg, and it had nothing in it? You'd be really disappointed, wouldn't you? Are you disappointed right now? <laughs> but here's the thing. We can't have Easter without the empty egg because the egg represents the tomb, right? So we can't have Easter without that. And so we hunt eggs and we have bunnies and cute flowers and things, but we have to remember the real reason of Easter is Jesus. So last week was Palm Sunday and we had lots of fun, right? We were waving palms and that's when Jesus went into Jerusalem. But a lot happened in one week, right? 
A lot happened. We got one with coins. <laughs> so a lot happened in that one week. And Jesus died on the cross for us on Friday, right? That's why. Who was here for the crosswalk? And we celebrated that. Yeah, we walked the cross down to the beach. He's got some money. And, okay, hold on to your stuff, okay, till we go up. Then Jesus died, and everybody was just devastated, right? And so then let me read you what it says in my kid's Bible in Luke 24. It was very early in the morning on the first day of the week. The women took the spices they had prepared. They went to the tomb. They found the stone and <laughs> rolled away from it. When they entered the tomb, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They were wondering about this. Suddenly, two men in clothes, as bright as lightning, stood beside them. The women were terrified. They bowed down with their faces to the ground. Then the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? Jesus is not here. He has risen. So, we can't have Easter without that empty egg or the empty tomb because Jesus died for us. You got a lot of candy, didn't you? <laughs> so, you might want to share with her because she didn't get anything. Yeah? He said, no, I'm not sharing with her. <laughs> I'll give you something when we get upstairs. So, I want you guys to remember, when you do your egg hunts, and when you take that candy out and you enjoy it, and then you have this empty egg, what this egg symbol sim signifies, right? It signifies that Jesus died for our sins, and he rose to be in heaven to watch over us and to be there for us, and there will be a day we are with him again. Amen? Amen. All right, so if you want to, because I know some of you are new, but if you want to, we're going to head in the back. See my mom and my daughter back there? We're going to go back there and follow them upstairs, and if you are picking your kids up, you go up the stairs or up the elevator and go that direction, and you will find us. Thank you. Happy Easter. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the stripes of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the stripes of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now, Mary stood outside the tomb, crying, as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw the two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you will put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to Mary. She turned around and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbi, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I am not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told him that what he had said to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Rebecca 
Allison, and I am a sinner saved by the grace of an amazing and awesome God. And it is my privilege to be a pastor here at Mariner's Bethel and to welcome you into this time of worship as well. And for those of you who are, how many of you are at sunrise service? There's a couple of you, yeah. I did change. Some were worried I wasn't going to change from my sweatshirt and sneakers, but I, I said, I dress for warmth out there. I'll dress differently in here. Go ahead. Good morning. My name is Glenn Collison, and it is a pleasure to be here. And for those who are online and those who are on site, our living God moves something within you to make you come here to stay, because you will hear the living truth of our living God. So let us pray. Oh, heavenly gracious Father, we come to you this day because you came to us, you died for us, and you rose for us. So let us give you thanks and be glad in it for this day. So Lord, I come to you now to ask for your spirit to live within Rebecca, that you speak through her the boldly, through boldness, that your truth, that you live and you died. But Lord, you give us forever life with you. So, Lord, continue to guide her and strengthen her in your ways as she walks with you each and every day. For, Lord, you have marked her path. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so how many showed up this morning because it's Easter? Oh, wait, come on. And how many are here because it's Resurrection Sunday? Okay, they're the good church people, right? Okay, so how many of you are here because someone told you to get dressed because you're going to church. <laughs> okay, truth, okay, truth, let's be a place of truth here. Well, I read an interesting article about a pastor whose church was actually divided on whether to call it Easter or whether to call it Resurrection Sunday. And he said his church was going to continue to call it Easter for a couple of reasons. And one of them was that sometimes the word resurrection, people might look at you strange because it might sound like a, a churchy insider word, but people, they get Easter, spring, okay, something new coming up, then they get that concept. Others don't like the word Easter because it has um, its roots in a pagan festival, which is true, but we also use the word Friday. And do you realize that Friday was based on a Norse goddess named Frog? And then there's recent research that said that Easter got its name from the German word, and I know I'm going to butcher it, so just be kind to me. Offestigung, which means, wait for it, resurrection. So regardless of your reason, or regardless of what you call it, let's all agree that we are here to celebrate life. Yes. Yes. Amen. All right. And we're doing it together. So if you have your Bibles or your electronic devices, I invite you to join me in the Gospel of John that's found in the New Testament. Now, all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all have the account of Jesus' life. They all talk about his ministry. They all talk about his death and his resurrection. They, talk, they go from when Palm Sunday we talked about last week to uh, when tensions started rising, how he ministered that week, how... There was a movement against him that led to his betrayal and a false arrest against him. Then they would take him to one religious leader, then to a government leader, and then back and forth until he was whipped and stripped within an inch of his life. And the cries, crucify him, sounded out. And they were only silenced when the crowd was given what it asked for. And Jesus Christ was put to death on a cross. The gospel tells us of his last words. It tells us of how his body was taken down from the cross, wrapped in a cloth, and laid in a tomb, and that tomb was sealed. That was Friday. Saturday came. Things were silent. You couldn't work on the Sabbath. And so we pick up on the third day, which is Sunday. And while the story kind of flows a little different because people are seeing it from different perspectives in those four Gospels, there are three things that remain the same in every one of the Gospels. It was early Sunday morning, the tomb was empty, and Mary Magdalene was there. So pick me up in the uh, book of John, chapter 20, verse 1. Early on Sunday morning, it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb, and she found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. 
Now, it's interesting to note that John wrote his gospel a full generation after Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And he wrote it for a specific purpose. See, for John, he had seen the fall of Jerusalem by that time. He had seen where the early church that had started to form were scattered because of persecution. He saw where believers were beginning to kind of falter in their faith, and were they really sure of what they actually believed? The church needed to be back at its roots. The church needed hope, and so do we. So verse 1 tells us that early in the morning, that garden tomb had visitors. Paul tells us Mary Magdalene came to prepare the body with these spices. Now, it's interesting to note a few chapters earlier in John's Gospel, he was talking how Lazarus had been in a tomb for four days, and according to Scripture, quoting Scripture, he stinketh. <laughs> okay? He'd been in there four days. He's, so those spices like aloe and myrrh, those were used to cover the smell of the decomposing body, as well as to pay respects. They were a way to remember the dearly departed. So before going early that morning, it was the earliest anyone could observe this uh, ritual because Sabbath had been the day before. So this woman's making her way to the garden as early as possible. The rest of the world is most likely still asleep. And she comes to the tomb where she had seen Jesus laid a few days earlier and is surprised to see the tomb open. This huge Four to six foot stone has been moved. So she's not sure what's going on. Goes, gets two of the disciples. Two disciples come and they look in and they see no body there. Literally, no body. <laughs> okay, a little slow. I know. Coffee's just kicking in. I got you. It's okay. But they say, yeah, you're right. This is basically empty. And it's interesting the detail that John adds. He goes, with verse, um, with the next verses, here we go. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. It's kind of interesting. What did he believe? For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said, Jesus must rise from the dead. See, there had been a foretelling of the death of the Messiah and of his resurrection. We read about it in the Old Testament. In scriptures like Psalm 22, in Jonah's reference to the three days, even in multiple references to in Isaiah 53 that had been written 700 years earlier. But it, that wasn't all. There were also gospel accounts that all record Jesus himself telling the disciples that the Son of Man would be rejected, suffer, and die, and after three days rise again. Even in John chapter 2, Jesus is talking about destroying and rebuilding the temple in three days. And the religious leaders are like, oh man, you know, this took a lot of years even to build. And they're not getting the idea he's talking about his body as a temple. Maybe the fact the disciples heard that their Lord was actually going to conquer death in a way like no one had ever seen before was just too good to be true. But either way... Both disciples came, they both saw, and they both left. But Mary Magdalene stayed. Pick me up in verse 11. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she stooped and she looked in. And she saw what the disciples hadn't seen. Now, it's interesting. Some of the Gospels have Mary Magdalene alone like John. Other accounts tell of other women with her, which would have made sense because girlfriends tend to travel in groups, even to the ladies' room, truth, okay? <laughs> but Mary Magdalene is significant, and the fact that John mentions her as his, his account, and actually she's mentioned in every single one of the gospel accounts by name, is significant. See, we don't know a lot about Mary Magdalene, but what we do know is she was a woman possessed by seven demons. Seven being that number of completeness, which means her life would have been seen as a complete mess. Emotionally, 
spiritually, psychologically, complete mess. Now, she was probably a woman of means, which meant she could support herself, but that doesn't mean she was really living. She was simply existing. Have you ever met somebody who seemed to just go through the motions of life and they're not really living? There's no joy. There's no hope. That must have been how Mary Magdalene felt until that day she met Jesus. And Jesus healed her. He brought her to life by healing her in full. The, the black and white movie of her life was now in living color. She was loved and accepted. She was a sinner with a capital S, if you will. And she was saved by grace and given a new life. And that's the one who is showing up at the tomb. And that's the person who is there in every single one of the Gospels. Now, she must have been shocked to learn when Jesus had been arrested and faced false charges to watch him hang on a cross and then see his body put in that tomb. That had to be so difficult. And so when she looks in and she sees a couple of these angels and they're asking why she's crying, and she's like, well, I don't know where he is. And then she, some voice from behind her says, well, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? And she had to think, I mean, she has to think. I mean, I would have at least. Seriously, with everything going on, you're asking me why I'm crying? And she kind of, I, I kind of think she abruptly, it doesn't say it per se in the scripture, but I think abruptly she would have said, okay, if you took him, just tell me where he is, I'll go get him. Kind of a little inflection in there. And then Jesus says, uh, <clears throat> Mary, she's surprised, she's startled, she's overwhelmed. She's rejoicing all at the same time. And then she turns. Isn't that how it is? When Jesus calls our name, we turn. We get turned around. And she is so overwhelmed to see him. And he's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Don't give me a hug yet. Yeah, I got to go to my father. Just, just breathe a little bit. That's in the white space. Your Bible doesn't have that. You know, just breathe a little bit. You know, I've got to go to my father. Tell my brothers I'm going to my father. So pick me up in verse 18. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and she told them, I have seen the Lord because that eyewitness is proof. And she gave them the message. She had been an insider, or excuse me, a sinner, an outsider, an outcast who had been pushed away from society. And she's the one who gave the first sermon that he lives. How cool is God? She says, I know he lives. I've seen him. Now, it's really easy. Jesus could have said to her, you know, I told you so. I told you I was going to die and then rise again in three days. But he didn't. Jesus could have reprimanded the disciples and said, you know, you should have had a little more understanding of what I've been teaching you these last three years. But he didn't. And Jesus could have resented their lack of faith, but he didn't because that's not how Jesus rolled then and that's not how he rolls now. See, even after Lazarus had died and Jesus arrived too late according to the family, he says the following. He tells them, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives in me, by believing in me, will never die. Do you believe this? I am the resurrection. You know, scholar N.T. Wright once wrote, Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of God's new project, not to snatch people away from earth to heaven, but to fill earth with the life of heaven. That, after all, is what the Lord's prayer is all about. We've already said that. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. See, it had that points to resurrection power. And Jesus saying, I am the life. Well, it's really interesting because in the Greek language, there are actually three words that can be translated into our English word of life. And those are bios, that's where you get biology from, that refers to your physical body. And all these are found in the Bible. 
There is the one that is shuka, it's pronounced shuka, but we get the word psychology or our psychological life, you know, of our soul. And then the third one, which is what Jesus is referring to as I am the life, and that is Zoha, the divine life possessed by God. It's unique. See, because here's the question that emerges from that. Jesus is the resurrection. He is the power. Jesus is the life. He is that divine part that comes to us. Church, the question is, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe he died for you on a cross and that he rose again? That he accomplished the impossible? Here's the thing. Each of us believes something. Not making a decision about what you believe is a decision in and of itself. We get to worship at the feet of the one who overcame death. Do you realize what kind of power that is? He could bring anybody out of a grave with one word. One scholar said, had Jesus not said specifically, Lazarus come out, that every tomb in Jerusalem would have given up its dead. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things in this life that we're not certain of, but one thing is certain, 100% of us one day will die. That we're certain of. Because these bodies weren't meant to last. And if you think it was, check with any doctor you've ever met. Because we go to try to keep them going. But one day, our time on this earth, in this body is up, but we're not done yet. We don't know. The thing is, what are you doing with your life that's been given to you today? What are you doing with the life that God has put in you? You know, when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're not only redeemed, we're not only reconciled before God, but we also receive that divine life. It helps bring us back from not just going through the motions to being alive. It brings us back to God's original intention for us. It's not about going to heaven one day. It's about bringing heaven to earth today. Amen. Not heaven to earth as in everything goes the way I want it to, but Christ's presence being right here with us. You know, Mariners, we talk about being a praying church. And it's not because we believe in what we say. We believe in what he said already. Amen. We're claiming his words. We're claiming his power. It's not us. We just know our God lives Jesus lives, and Jesus' power rose the dead. If he can do that, he can do anything for his glory, to point people to him. What is impossible and improbable that you're facing today? And have you taken it to the one who has overcome the world? Friends, do you realize the power of when we say we believe in Jesus Christ, the power that's right there? That we just like leave it in a saying? That he walks beside you and he is with you and he is at work in you. If he can do this, what else can he do that you haven't even imagined yet? Do you have anything that needs that resurrection power this morning? Maybe there's a physical diagnosis that seems hopeless. Maybe there's, you need a refreshing peace because your life has just been in turmoil. Maybe there's worry and stress over a loved one. Maybe you have even considered yourself, why am I still here? Jesus has a purpose. And it all points back to the Father to give him the glory for everything. <laughs> because he has put his life in you. Many people come to know who Jesus is through you. And too often, unfortunately, sometimes people find out who Jesus is not through us. We're not meant to be perfect. We're just meant to point people to him. We are not the saviors he is. So if you believe this day that Jesus is the resurrection and that he is the life, then at one point, hopefully, you have been baptized. And if you haven't, you know, Easter is a time we often talk about baptism because the ba baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace, of something that happens in our hearts when it gets turned around. When we hear Jesus calling for us and our hearts turn around and we say, yes, he is not just 
Lord, and I go on with my life. He is the lead of my life. I will obey him. I will remember to, to seek his face. I will be devoted unto him. And so on April 21st, we have about three weeks, three Sundays from now, we will have our confirmation class who are going to be confirming their baptism. All of them have been baptized to this date, and they're going to confirm that and reaffirm it and what it means in their life. And they wanted to open that up to all of you as well. That if you've been baptized at some point in your life, that if you've come to a new understanding of who, you, who your Lord and Savior is or who you are in Christ, and you're not what you were, but you're moving on forward to sanctification, then they want to invite you that day to come forward and, and reaffirm your faith, reaffirm your baptism. Because if you're like I was, I was, I was like babe in arms when I got baptized. And I don't remember it. But I reaffirmed it later when I understood everything that it meant. Because it's not about the water. It's about the living water. Amen. That's what it's about. And it doesn't matter how wet you get. Because a little bit of Jesus goes a long way. <laughs> and here's the thing. If for some reason you've never confessed that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you're like, yeah, I kind of believe that. Either you do or you don't. Once, and I've said this before in a sermon, someone once told me that the devil owns the fence. If you're sitting on the fence, you're not in it all with Jesus. You don't have to live that out like somebody else. You live it out as God has wired you. That's why he made you like you are. To live out his faith and to share that where he takes you in, his, in life. Because you will go places I don't go. And that's why he made all of us in different realms of life in different areas so that we can spread the good news of his love and grace that doesn't follow you know, certain parameters except that it is a loving grace that points directly to our Father God who so loved the world that he gave his only son so that we could know eternal life and not to condemn us but to save us. He is the one we answer to one day. So next three weeks from now, if you want to reaffirm that faith by baptism, if you want to be baptized for the first time, then at the end of the service, I invite you to uh, meet with somebody at the rail or, or with the prayer room. They'll take your information down. By the way, thank you guys for doing that. I didn't ask. Uh, <laughs> sorry, it's a God thing. Take it up with him. Um, you get that information together, and we'll make sure, because we, we take it seriously. We want to have a conversation that you understand all that that means. <coughs> And we'll make sure that that happens. But here's the thing. Don't be surprised when everything changes. And life takes on a new meaning. Because Jesus said he'd die and rise again, and he did. With a power and presence that's beyond words. Can you just imagine what else he can do? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us pray. Heavenly and gracious Father, we come to you this day. And we just raise praise to you. We did it this morning through song, Lord, but we come to you with all our hearts. And it's a joyous time because you are not in the grave. You are alive. You are a God who is living and is faithful and is loving and is full of grace and full of mercy that we need because we can't do this all on our own. Father God, I just, I call, we call out to you this day as a church and and. And all your body, Lord, that if there are any present who have a praise to give to God, let us give that praise to him now out loud that we thank you, God, that we praise you, God, that we love you, God. If you praise God, if you love him, then I'm going to take my mic off for a second. Then lift up your praise and tell him that. Praise you, God. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. You are awesome. You are wonderful. You are ever you are ever loving. Lord, we lift these praises to you this day. You are just so beyond anything we can imagine. That you would do that for us. That you didn't wait for us to get our act together before you saved us. That you didn't wait to get our act together before you sent your son. You did that while we were yet sinners. And that proved your love for us. You didn't set that condition on us. Lord God, we just... We just pray that up to you, Lord. Without you, we can't do this. Because without
without you, we don't want to do this life alone. We need your resurrection power to take the dead stuff in our life and clean it out. We don't want it sticking up our lives. We want you filling us. We want you to pour in your spirit. That you just wash away anything in us that doesn't live for you. And Lord, we know I'm not going to be like that person. That person's not going to be like me. You made us unique and that's okay, Lord. Because in that uniqueness, we, we see the beauty of your love. We don't always understand, Lord. But we come to you. And we lift our praises and we lift our joys. And we lift all glory unto you on this resurrection, Easter, Sunday, whatever day we call it. Because it's all about you. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 This time, if you would rise in body or spirit and we join together in singing once more because our God lives. Amen? Amen. Oh, that's weak. I ought to hear better than that. Our God lives. Amen. He is alive. Amen. Amen. Amen.
God's not dead. He sure made a lie.